start with some introductions again. So welcome to our discussion about adults with incapacity. I'm Linda Boyd, Senior Manager with East Ayrshire Health and Social Social Care Partnership. And with me is my colleague, Anne Craig. I'm the Team Manager. This afternoon, we're presenting a model for adults with incapacity who are approaching or have become delayed discharge within hospital. And at the core um, of our approach is that we respect the Act, the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000, and the principles of that are that it must be of benefit to the person, that we consider the least restrictive option for them. We take account of the views of both past and present, if they've expressed those wishes, and if there's any other interested person who um, is, is caring for them. Year on year, it has become evident that increasing numbers of people who are admitted to hospital have a degree of cognitive frailty. For many of these people, admission to hospital crystallises their cognitive frailty, either due to clinical reasons or being out of a familiar environment. And this contributes to them being delayed within hospital. Anne is now going to talk through her experiences as a social worker working very closely in partnership with the NHS and the other health and social care partnerships in Ayrshire and describe how we have addressed this, this issue. And I'll pass over to Anne. Hello everybody. Um, hospital should no longer remain just an accounting for me to complete I often talk about my early, early days in social work where an assessment could take as long as 28 days before a patient was required to move to their next destination. That it now seems a lot. Looking back, I wonder if the patients that I worked with at that time had the opportunity to regain some of the abilities whilst in an NHS bed. However, that said, in our hospitals we've seen a shift in the patient profile. By the time our patients present, they're likely to be much less able than previously. In East Ayrshire, we've successfully continued to keep our residents living in the In December 18, the East Partnership, in conjunction with North and South Partnership, announced a pilot project to move patients from an NHS in the Ayrshire Victorian Health Board area to a care placement. The basis of which was an NHS commission Scott Purchase Care Home Placement. These patients had been assessed as unable to meet welfare longer needed inpatient whilst awaiting a formal order. For example, a welfare partnership or an intervention order. So that a fair placement could be arranged for them. This pilot came to an end in March 2019. North and South Partnerships did not continue with this, but East Partnership recognised the benefits our patients and decided it would continue to operate the AWI bed availability arrangements on the basis that it would care in the right place at the right time. So how do we do this? The social work team at Cross House have worked tirelessly over the years to ensure that we're considered to be an integral part of supporting patients through their health journey. 
team are knowledgeable in health conditions, and but skilled in social work and social care assessments. We're passionate about what we do. We take an immense amount of pride in the work that we do, own that work, we own that patient, and we own that journey alongside our patients and our families. We take a can-do approach to everything. If we're asked to get involved, we definitely will. We invented the phrase, and I hear it quite often, that is delayed discharge, not in my watch. We were recently asked to give a presentation to our senior surgical charge nurses. The question being, what do hospital social workers do? Presentation not do. What are the drivers for the change? Why do we do what we do? Daily, we meet patients and their families who could be hospitalised for a long period. Research has shown that long periods in hospital can be detrimental to adding life to years, as well as adding years to life. I would ask you to have a look at Angela Rowe's presentation on NPJ paralysis. Some of the st statistics for that were quite startling. I want that for my nearest and dearest. And I have to say on that, uh, we regularly set up charge arrangements, be that for returning home or transfer to a care home placement, when the patient becomes unwell again and their discharge is delayed. But we'll not know if this is definitely as, as a result of delaying a discharge when the patient is fit. But it needs to be something we should always consider. In my last presentation, I talked a bit about early referral. Um, and this is part of the AWI process. We recognise that referring patients early for social work assessment has significant benefits to success. This has been key to success in reducing the time that a person remains in hospital after they're fit for discharge. And also the benefit to the patient is to have lost the ability to manage their lives in a particularly older adults discharge, and they also require less assistance as their recovery continues. These partnership staff have promoted the use of early referral with their health colleagues over the last few years, and were able to evidence positive outcomes. Cross House has been attendance at the twice daily huddles, morning and afternoon, where specific patient information is exchanged with their health colleagues. In addition to this, we have a dedicated time every day to meet with our discharge hub colleagues. This is to facilitate any specific information exchange that is required, but not appropriate for the main hospital huddles. So, the huddles in the hub are attended by staff from the social work team based in the hospital. We have promoted the early referral model with all hospitals in NHS Ayrshire both acute and community. We also attend specific white multidisciplinary decision making. We engage daily with our ACE practitioners in our combined assessment unit huddle at noon, and key to successes have been engaging with and this report received support received from our quality improvement team from NHS Ayrshire. Activity has been described by a colleague, and again yesterday, as pulling referrals rather than waiting for them to be made to us. So we're actively seeking people who require support rather than waiting for the referral to come. In my last presentation, I talked about discharge to assess. This has been in operation in East Ayrshire since April 2015. East Partnership put in place which is essentially moving a person to the preferred choice of placement. A two-week framework time frame is in place for the assessment by the social worker to be undertaken and presented to a local resource allocation group for consideration of funding. There is no charge to the resident during this time, and East Partnership funds the whole placement. At the end of the assessment, there will be a clearer outcome for the resident and their families, either that a care home needs to continue, 
may be possible for the resident to return to the community at some point in the future. Slight now shows some detail about the discharge to assess since the 1st of April to yesterday. Um, 22 people, it feels like a lot more, I have to say, 22 people have been discharged to care assessment out with an NHS facility, but we also have avoided 286 bed days. Service costs, um, it's not an awful lot, but the days avoided is another £20,000 on top of that. There we go. That's just a, a summary of what I've just already said. It does, however, give a detail of the, posit the positives for the patient, but also social allowing social workers to devote sufficient time to supporting people and their families to make life changing decisions about their future. I think the early referrals, um, where we're, we're in um, talking to people before the patient's ready for discharge, allows us to have a much, much better outcome for the patient. And also, patient flow is significant, significantly improved. So, um, I've talked about improved patient flow and reduction of patient length of stay, but we have, and, and um, I'll show you some detail about the orders and, and what has happened. New orders have been um, made recently, um, and we also immediately have a dedicated MHO for all um, people who require um, AWI processes. Patient carer experience has improved, and I think one of the things that I'm seeing more and more is the thank yous that we very rarely get um, about helping people to make those life-changing decisions um, are coming quite regularly now. The multidisciplinary approach has improved partnership working, and, and somebody described me the other day there as, as like a Rottweiler, but in a good way, and it's where um, We also are in there and talking to our partners and having discussions about that patient and the patient journey. Last week, I was asked to go and talk to the care home providers because they are the people who take care of patients um, and make decisions about whether they can help them or not. And the feedback was really, really good. Um, so they, that in itself made us, made me feel that we were doing the right thing. Um, so we were I'm going to the next one. So the nuts and bolts are how we do things. Um, um, plan. So referrals when we receive them will be screened or triaged that day. Screened if the, the referral comes from Cross House Hospital, whether face to face with either a patient or the ward staff, but triaged by phone if it's out with Cross House. Other than that, it would be at the earliest next working day. Allocations will be within 24 to 48 hours to social worker. Patient and the family meeting will take place, hopefully, within 24 hours of allocation. And the preliminary assessment will be undertaken in the next few days. Multidisciplinary decision um, or multidisciplinary assessment. And taking on board what everybody has to say. Um, and again, that's part of the early referral process. Um, and we would make a decision at that point about what's, what's the right pathway. Once the social workers have, have done that part, we they would come to myself or a colleague um, as a team manager and have a discussion about the appropriateness of an adults with incapacity access and an adults with incapacity bed. That would then mean that if, if it's agreed, they would progress to find a care placement of choice. That's all part of what we would do now, bearing in mind that Care Home will have a funding, an NHS bed rather than a partnership 
funded by an East Ayrshire local authority, partnership funded by this. I think key to all this is that we have patients going from one bed to another, to another, to another. And part we will do is make sure that, again, looking at the Scottish Government Choices Guidance, um, a patient will still have that choice and we will make every endeavour for it to be one move. Being secured for the placement transfer. And again, this is where I talk about, this is where my, in my a perfect world would line up. This can happen reasonably quickly um, with the ducks in a line. But sometimes we have to just take a step back and start again, unfortunately. Okay. usually of their choice. I'm less keen on beds, it's not their choice. However, sometimes second choice can be just as good. And we do find in many occasions that if we're using a second or third choice, patients actually choose to remain in the care home where they've been first discharged to. Um, the adults with incapacity case conference, I like to, to hold within a few days of transfer to the placement and that would be in the care home itself. I just want to say though that at that point I have on several occasions deferred the decision about the necessity for a legal framework because very often that patient's still in their um, recovery. So if they're in the recovery journey it really would be inappropriate to make a decision um, and what usually we defer it for what feels appropriate at that time. When we have the Adults with Incapacity Case Conference, our dedicated mental health officer um, would come, come along and be to um, that conversation. They would meet the families, they would meet the other residents, and they will take it from there in terms of a legal framework being appropriate or not. And that would be for them to pick that up alongside the allocated. So I'm just going to talk a wee bit about a and bolts, but this is actually no different from a discharge test assess process. And our arrangements and assessments for transfer remain the same. The shift is that now we are able to place our patient in a homely setting and undertake a incapacity case, home, case conference in the care home. Rarely would I have an opportunity to undertake an adult with incapacity case conference for access to an adult with incapacity bed whilst the patient is in hospital. It's unlikely, but it, it's not out with the realms of possibility. Mental health officer to the team would be involved right at the very start, and we're quite we've noticed that that's one of the things that's made a huge difference. The downside is that when we have the patient has moved to a homeless setting, and their cognitive ability does take time to improve. And when I do defer a decision, good reason, but it does not. It does give me a bit of cause for concern, um, but we, we would usually do that. I have no time frame from that. That's what's right for the for the patient. I'm going to talk a wee bit about the challenges. There are challenges. Um, the Mental Welfare Commission have raised concerns. Mental health officers locally have raised concerns in terms of the governance arrangements. Availability of the care home of choice and the care home's agreement to have patients who are AWI funded. Ongoing oversight of patients' medical care, the shift from consultant overview to GP overview. And are patients' rights being compromised or whose rights are being compromised? And I think I just want to say I've got a much loved Auntie Mary who's 90 and to see her stuck in an ambulance at combined assessment because there isn't a bed for her. Because there are patients in beds who don't need to be there. It 
it's not in their best interest and it's certainly not conducive to improving their cognitive impairment and it's not conducive to Auntie Mary getting what she, the care she needs. So, um, the same slide as we had for the D2A up to date. It's 1st April, 18 people discharged. Thousands and 67 bed days avoided. You'll see the service costs are quite significantly higher. Again, the, the cost of the bed um, has got quite a significant increase. That is 80, whatever. So of those 18 patients, um, this has been their outcomes have been granted guardianships, six have had cognitive improvement and no longer required guardianships, with one of those patients actually returning home. Sadly, before the guardianship process was completed, and six are still ongoing. So that's really where we're at in terms of um, adults with incapacity. I put this up and I'm going to tell you why it's there. Because to um, a story of how we would take a patient through um, the AWI process and all about that patient and the patient in a bed. It's actually based on me in 30 years time. I'm not going to share that with you just now, but maybe that's for another day. Um, it does worry me, and I think we really, really need to look at how we deal with this. Um, maybe this won't be Bella's outcome, but I would hate to think that that was me stuck in a hospital bed without knowing where I was body looking after for me, and either in my own home and in a homely environment. Can I just ask you to have a wee look at the um, the references that I've put on? Um, a lot of these are, are where I, I've taken um, but also many other resources that have just been wholeheartedly important to me and what I do every day. Um, so these are there for you and I just wanted to say thanks very much for taking the time to dial in. And I'll pass you back to Linda, who will just close. Thank you very much, Anne, for your detail. What's particularly important in Anne's presentation um, is the fact that the person is at the very centre of everything that's been happening. Understanding what the person's wishes and desires are with their family member or carers, and doing so at the earliest point in their arrival into hospital. And ensuring that that individual doesn't stay one day longer than required. It's also key to recognise that every single individual has completed their hospital stay. They have been assessed as clinically discharged. The multidisciplinary team has agreed that they're ready for discharge and no longer require hospital care. So to stay in hospital sometimes for 80 days while a guardianship process is continued within the courts. Those days been a day that they do not require to be there. It's worth a few seconds to focus. Angela Rose's presentation, the stuff that we've all probably read around NG, end PG paralysis, indicates that a person in a hospital, especially an acute hospital stay is typical to be sitting in their bed or getting out of their bed and sitting at a chair to the toilet on their own or with assistance, getting their meals and usually looking at the other people in the same room as them. Sometimes individuals have been cohorted and are in a room or in a community hospital with other people who are also delayed in their discharge and bearing in mind individuals have already starting to be assessed it's been cognitively impaired very little stimulation very little conversation 
very little mobility. Recognise that individuals are losing their muscles, they are getting weaker, they are less likely to maintain the independence that they had, they're more likely to become frailer and at a rapid pace. PJ paralysis tells us that it only takes a few days in hospital to lose the equivalent of, of 10 years of muscle loss, and that's a very stark figure. What you will find, on the contrary, is that an individual, when they're able to move into a care home bed, is mobilising the day, participating in any activities, able to go on any trips that they wish to go on and have been discussed with their family. Entertainment, there'll be physical activity and meals. That homely environment has been so much more positive. The fact that Anne and her team have had from the families, which she described as, you know, as some thank you letters, actually been glowing about the significant changes that's made to people's life um, as a country to having spent that in hospital. I can, for the detail that she's um, provided to us, and give the opportunity now to everybody who's dialed in to ask any questions around some of the specifics. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Linda Ann. That was a really interesting presentation. So um, I'm up yet, but if you do have any, if you just want to type them, type them into the, the chat box there. Um, I suppose one question from me would be that through moving people into the more homely setting to wait that is their guardianship, do you see them some of them maybe regaining capacity and, and actually not needing that to go through that process in the end? Is that I think that's fair. Um, I have a real concern that um, potentially people who have been assessed as not having capacity in hospital could have been an environmental issue because of where they've been assessed. And I wonder now if that's the right place for that decision to be made. So when we take people to um, a more homely environment and they get all the things that Linda talking about, I do think that we'll see that less guardianships will be required. Mm -hmm. um, or it may well be that we will be looking at more people being able to um, instruct a power of attorney, um, which has actually happened more recently, um, in the, just actually in the last few days. Um, and that's been really, 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 really positive. It's only one at the moment, but we don't have an awful lot of people who've gone through this process. It's only been going through since essentially April. Um, so, yes, I think so. And you mentioned that your, your beds were NHS funded. So, so how does that, that work? Is that... It's been essential um, to ensure that this is actually part of uh, an NHS fund funded process. Whilst the individual is in hospital and whilst inappropriately in an NHS hospital, it is not possible for local authority funding to purchase that bed in a care home. And effectively, we are commissioning from an NHS perspective with the care homes with a set of contract that bed, and it becomes part of the um, cohort of beds that the NHS has available to it. So whilst the individual is still effectively in a hospital bed, one that's been, that's been purchased from a care home rather than in an actual acute hospital, community hospital setting, so much more appropriate care whilst the guardianship has been awaited. Okay, thanks. Um, on that, we've got a couple of questions come in from Peter Doherty. Peter's asking, first of all, are the people moving into your area by under thirty? No. No. Thirteen Z A would um, mean that a patient had the ability to consent, um, and these are as not having the ability to consent to a hospital move, hospital to hospital, or hospital to care home move. So no, in this situation, thirteen Z A is not appropriate. 
And Peter's second question is that you mentioned some concerns the Mental Welfare Commission had, and I just wondering what, what they were. Was a complication for me, is it? Yes, the, the Mental Welfare Commission, when we consulted them at the very beginning of this process, wanted to be assured that we were taking the person's um, best interests, and we were def definitely considering, first and foremost, the least restrictive option for the person. With that bed still being an NHS bed and effectively being a transfer of care to another NHS bed, those concerns were, were alleviated. Um, and Anne certainly has worked very closely with the person and with the family around making sure those moves are as smooth as possible and continuously reviewed. So the person, whilst charged from hospital, is still within the NHS setting through that contract. Okay, thank you. Don't know, does anyone else have any questions out there before we, we wrap up today's session? A minute. I'll mention that we set a target in East Ayrshire to reduce the number of people um, total as a delayed discharge who were waiting to go um, to care home or for guardianship. And we set a target to improve that by 20%. It's a target and it's a number that's absolutely reducing stay in the hospital for people far exceeded um, and I think that the um, emphasis that has been placed on supporting individuals in that homely setting far exceeds the benefit of just saving a simple bed day for people. Um, the, the case stories of each individual are actually heartwarming. Thanks Linda, thank you. I think if there are no final questions out there in the virtual world, we'll, we'll wrap this week's session up. Um, and I hope you've all enjoyed it and I found it informative. And apologies for the sound. 